Do you remember your baptism? Yes. yes. If you were baptized as an infant, the chances are great that you won't remember your baptism, that you will have no memory of it. If you were baptized as a child, maybe 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, your memory, you may have some memory of the event. But if you were baptized as an adult, your memory will be much clearer, and your understanding of, bapt of baptism may be different. In the Lutheran Church, if you change membership from one church to another, it doesn't matter whether it's a Lutheran Church or a Baptist Church or a Catholic Church, we have what is called an affirmation of baptism. We simply repeat some of the words, some of the commitments that you made in your original baptism. But one thing we all know is that we believe in one baptism, regardless of the faith tradition that you were baptized in. We believe, again, in one baptism. Now, back to my original question. What do you remember about your baptism? How has it affected your life? And what difference did or does it make now? I'd like to share with you my remembrance of my baptism that occurred some 70 years ago uh, in a church not far from here, a church that is now 157 years old, a church that started out at the edge of a field in what is known as a great arbor. There were nine or ten of us in a Sunday school class, and for some reason, five of us decided that we were going to join the church. And you've heard those, those words, especially if you grew up in the South. And joining the church meant becoming officially a member of the family of the congregation. And so we decided to do that. We told no one. Not our parents, not even the pastor, not our Sunday school teachers, we told no one. And so one fateful day, at the end of a sermon, the pastor did what is called, he opened the doors of the church. Now this scares the heck out of some people. But it is, uh, uh, this uh, statement follows traditionally the historic Christian church which says that there should, be, there should never be any meeting of Christians where an invitation is not issued to people to become Christians. I know that to be so, because I grew up with that, but we had two students uh, in, at the Lutheran Center who came through the ITC who wrote a thesis on that, a doctoral thesis, and studied it over a period of three years, going to various congregations or so to see how this was practiced. So traditionally, then the pastor would give a, hopefully a powerful sermon and would invite people into Christian discipleship. We don't do that here, but we always open ourselves up. We always invite people. In the bulletin, you will see that. But we invite people also through our participation in the community itself. So on that warm Sunday morning, we, five of us walked up to the altar and stood there, and the pastor looked at us, and he motioned for some of the members of the congregation to come and stand with us. And after taking our names and doing all of those things, he decided that we would be baptized in, in one month. Now, the, the month that he decided that we would be baptized was September. And as you know, September was a, can be a hot month. It can be sticky. But that month did come. And all of us, the five of us, assembled. We had on our white shirts and white trousers. And some of the kids had on shoes that they did not mind getting wet. During the service that morning after the affirmation of faith and the Apostles' Creed, the whole congregation stood and marched or processed out of the church, down the steps, down the street, about a half block away, to a makeshift pond. The pond had been made from a uh, branch, a small creek, that emanated from a spring. In that area of the county, water just bubbled up out of the ground. And one by one, they baptized, or they dumped people, 
of the kids underwater, no one drowned, both them back up. Two of us, however, opted not to be dumped, but we opted either for sprinkling or for pouring. And at that point, the passage would pour from a, from a shell the water over our heads. So that essentially was the baptism. There was lots of singing, and there were lots of praying, and there was a party afterwards. The congregation process, process down to the pool uh, with a hymn that most of you know, and that hymn was take, uh, uh, entitled, Take Me to the Water. Take me to the water to be baptized. And they came back into the congregation singing Amazing Grace. So that, in essence, was a baptism for us. Things are not done that way now so much, but historically, that is, again, the baptism. The question that one has to ask, and I've often asked that myself, what did a nine-year-old, and I was nine years old, what could and what did a nine-year-old know and understand about baptism? All of the Sunday school, all of the preaching was geared toward that after that baptism. And so our lessons came after the act, not so much before. During our conversation with the pastor, each one of us had to be asked what we would prefer, and then we had to give a reason for that. One thing again, I note that the water in the font was a crystal bowl that sat in front of the church, and the water in the pool were different. I noted that for you. The water in the pool was more like what we find today in the River Jordan. It was murky, not particularly clean. As a matter of fact, we had often down at this branch to play in it. But the water in the crystal bowl was clean, clear, and above all, it was warm. We were told that our baptism was Baptist, we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were told that this was a new identity for us. It was, we were told that this new identity would compel, compel us to go out into the world and share the abundant love of God with those who were not yet part of the church family. I was not sure what that meant at this time. After all, I was nine years old, not much of a theologian at that point. All the way from Genesis and the creation story, from the world's flood out of the Exodus, God provided water in the desert, in the New Testament. In the New Testament where Jesus lived and where Jesus taught at the Sea of Galilee, and on and on through Revelation, where the river of life flowed through the city of God. It was a woman by the well where Jesus promised living water to all who thirst. But Jesus told her one thing that was very important and that we would want to remember today, that Jesus was the source and is the source of living water. Water washes us and the origin of baptism can be found based on that point in the Jewish rites the Jewish people would wash their bodies and symbolically as an act of being purified so that they could enter the temple. New converts to Judaism were also uh, included in a baptism rite so that they would be clean and they could enter the synagogue or the temple. On this day that was described in the, in the Gospel this morning, Multitudes came out to join John the Baptist, not so much to show their faith or to demonstrate that they already had forgiveness, but they were there because there was a new way of hearing and preaching God's word. They came to John and they turned to him in repentance so that they could receive forgiveness of their sin. John appeared in the wilderness he appeared proclaiming a baptism of repentance for this to be a of sin. In other words, he appeared to them to begin the process of change. 
And we are still, even today, working on this process of change. I want to ask a Jewish professor in one of the classes, why do you think, and what does the Jewish faith tell us about change in human beings? Why do you think it is so difficult for us to change? And he answered two simple words. He said, change hurts. That's why it's so difficult for us to change. Our bodies and our communities work to maintain stability. When change occurs, the body will work and the community will work to return everything back to the original state. We often move towards self-serving comfort, survival, and the body will do everything it can to survive. When we enter the unknown, we are always moving toward uh, things that may hurt us, and the body and our system will always try to move back. We wonder why the body attempts to maintain a certain temperature. We wonder why the body may seek to maintain a certain blood pressure. All of these things are designed by God to protect the body and to protect us. Everything is aimed at stability. But stability may not be the best way to live in this world because things around us are changing constantly. One of the more evident changes that you may not know about is the body temperature. Historically, the body temperature has been 98.6 degrees. But in recent times, among large numbers of population, the body temperatures are dropping on average uh, to about 97 or 97.6. And scientists and the doctors speculate that this is because the temperature of the environment is warming up, so there's no need to maintain a higher temperature in the body. We can wonder back and forth whether or not progress is being made, whether or not things are being invented, whether or not we are preserving ourselves by maintaining stability. The answer to that is obviously the great inventions the great literature of the world, the great music, comes about as a result of someone stepping outside these comfort zones, stepping out into zones of change. Jesus, in fact, was crucified because of the change that he proposed. He was crucified because he put pressure on the systems. The political system with Rome being the oppressor, and the theological or the religious systems was the temple. The people in the temple, or the officials, were not necessarily vicious people or mean spirit people, but they were trying to maintain the system so that they would not be destroyed by Rome. They got it wrong. They were eventually destroyed because the world needs different answers. That situation in Palestine and in Jerusalem needed answers different from what was being proposed and being lived. They did not imagine what it would take then to continue to resist Rome and to even resist their own people who were calling for liberation and independence. But Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized. John tried to prevent him from being baptized by John, saying that I need to be baptized by you, not the opposite. But Jesus said, let's just do what the scriptures are telling us. And let's just go with this at this time. When Jesus was baptized, as you heard in the scripture, immediately when he came up from the water, the heavens opened up. They were made open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. The dove came to rest on his shoulder. And a voice came out. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. 
You will hear that over and over again during this season. Another variation of that is, this is my son, listen to him. But it was this baptism where Jesus identified with the marginalized people, with people who were less than powerful, with people who were not that sophisticated. He came to identify himself, not only with the people in Jerusalem, but in the countryside, with the serfs and with peasants. He came to, uh, to engender himself to them. He came so that we could change our minds about God. And all of those people who went out to John, those from Jerusalem and those from the countryside, they wanted baptism for the forgiveness of sin, but they wanted to hear it additionally in a different voice. They wanted God's grace. They wanted a different life. Entrance, I would bet included in that, in our tradition, because we follow Jesus' command in Matthew 28, go ye forth and baptize all nations. Translated, baptize and teach people, all people, regardless of their identities. And so, these five boys, back 70 years ago, came back into the congregation and said, and they read it themselves, we read it themselves, ourselves, for a boring life, according to some people. The boring life does start with baptism, but is not completed until we die unto Christ. We live each day in remembrance of our baptism, remembering that God loves us with his love and with his goodness. What does your baptism mean to you? And why is it or is not important to you today? As you come to the altar today, remember that you are loved and you are forgiven. You are free to sing God's praises. You are free to use your hands and your feet to do God's work in the world. Thanks be to God for all of our baptisms. Amen.